Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Leon Hartwell, and I'm a Sartoff Fellow at LSE, at LSE Ideas. I'd like to welcome everyone for the second LSE Ideas Russia-Ukraine Dialogue. Given the recent escalation of the war on the 24th of February, the conflict continues to be fluid and it requires cross-disciplinary analysis. LSE Ideas has set up the Russia-Ukraine Dialogues in recognition that the war is one of the most consequential events of our time. Russia's invasion of Ukraine represents the largest conventional military attack since World War II. With our dialogues, we will follow the conflict closely and promote factual discussion about the situation as it unfolds. Since the escalation of the conflict, the humanitarian situation has become dire. Nearly 3 million Ukrainians have become refugees. IRC, which is not known for using dramatic language, has described Mariupol as being suffocated. Meanwhile, we are increasing, uh, increasingly witnessing on social media how Kiev is slowly being reduced to rubble. In Russia, meanwhile, Putin seems to become rapidly more insecure with the very brave Marina Ovsyanikova now joining over 15,000 Russians who have been arrested for protesting against the war. I want to emphasize again to our audience how NATO and Western allies respond to this recent escalation of the Russia-Ukraine war will inevitably also have major impacts on the global order. It is my privilege to introduce a very distinguished panel. Firstly, I would like to introduce Captain Jason Israel. He is a non-resident fellow with the Transatlantic Leadership Program at the Center for European Policy Analysis in Washington, DC. Uh, he's also a former director at the White House National Security Council. He joins us today from Sydney, Australia. Secondly, I'd like to introduce the Honorable Radoslav Sikorsky. He's a member of the European Parliament. He's also a member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence and Digital Age, and the Subcommittee on Security and Defense. Thirdly, uh, I'd like to introduce Sir Jamie Shea, Professor of Strategic Studies at the University of Exeter and a visiting professor uh, in international strategy and diplomacy here at LSE Ideas. He's a good friend of ours. Uh, he's also uh, a former uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Emerging Security Challenges at NATO. And finally, uh, uh, I would also like to welcome Dr. Gorana Gurgic. Uh, she is jointly appointed Senior Lecturer at the Department of Government and International Relations at the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney. Uh, in 2021, she was also uh, the Partners Across Globe Research Fellow at the NATO Defense College. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start off with Jason. Um, Jason, I'd like to call on you to kick off this discussion by giving us the military perspective on what you've been seeing uh, in Ukraine. Uh, what are you seeing on the battlefield and, and uh, and more importantly, what are some of the most significant changes that you've seen develop over the last few days? Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for having me, Leon. And good to have uh, this panel here. Very nice to meet you. Um, thank you also for mentioning my Navy Reserve affiliation. Just as a reminder, um, I'm not on duty, so these views are my own. Um, I come to you as a military planner, uh, spending the last 12 years in the joint world from the White House, the Pentagon, and multiple combatant commands, um, and certainly not an expert on the region, um, though I have done a tour um, with NATO in Europe and um, been providing, um, as we all have watching this close. Uh, when you talk about things as a military planner, it comes across um, as a little cold. Um, so I'd like to start out at uh, all of us recognize with the numbers and the situation that you provided uh, that our hearts are very much close to the people who are suffering uh, horrific, um, unimaginable um, casualties and in, in Ukraine right now. And as we're looking at this situation broadly, the question uh, when it comes to looking at the Russian military that many people have is, why is it uh, that it looks like Putin's operational goals have not been met, uh, that Putin's forces have been slowed and that, that Putin has been unable to capture major cities despite efforts in trying. So I'm going to focus my remarks specifically on that. As a military planner, you look at things as an, with an end state, and I'll introduce another military term that you may have heard of, which is the enemy's center of gravity. Um, a center of gravity occurs at both the strategic level 
and at the operational level. Um, so I'll start out with Putin's end state. Um, while day to day, and rightfully so, we're going to look at movement of forces physically um, and number of casualties as we examine a battle and a war and battle by battle, you may think of that as, uh, well, this is the major um, metric to follow. Um, reminding ourselves that when military planners get together and they actually look at a scenario like this, they do calculate these things. They calculate the number of uh, the amount of equipment, um, the, the reputation lost, the damage to the economy and the number of people that are lost. Uh, so we should know, and we do know that Putin in and, and his leadership within Russia will calculate the, this number of casualties and has calculated this number of casualties um, into, the, into the plan that went forward. Now, that being said, this military plan underscores the reason that we do military planning. Um, there's a sort of tongue-in-cheek but true statement about our military planning process, which will spend months in advance putting a military plan on the shelf, even one that um, is not um, for, a, for a current operation. And it is that the plan, it, the plan is not as valuable as the planning process. And in the planning process, Putin would look at um, what are all of the factors involved? Um, what are the different ways that the enemy's center of gravity, in this case, I've assessed to be Ukraine's willingness to fight and the willingness for partners to support Ukraine? Um, how could Russia break that down? Clearly, uh, Russia has miscalculated there. The Ukrainians are inspirational right now in their defense of their homeland. And they're certainly seeing no, uh, no reduction in the willingness of allies uh, to support Russia. That's at the strategic level. At the operational level, which is the assignment of forces around, what we're seeing is uh, generally, and this is a, a, a broadly what we're seeing is uh, that Ukrainian forces have moved uh, to major cities. Um, we saw most of the fighting has been in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, we're seeing um, you know, Sumy, um, on, uh, as well as approaches to Kyiv, um, as well as Kharkiv being heavily, um, being heavily uh, shelled. Uh, we also saw this past week in the West, in Lviv, um, uh, one of the first major targets there. Uh, the, the calculation there being that Putin was trying to both make a statement that Russia can project to Western Ukraine, um, but also this was right after the Deputy Foreign Minister of Russia stated that the, uh, the convoys of military equipment coming into Western Ukraine um, were legitimate military targets. Um, so trying to, to sort of, um, at the more the strategic level, um, warn the West that um, any more in, any increases in assistance to Ukraine could actually uh, move the uh, can make the make Russia consider the West and NATO as a combatant uh, within this, which of course Putin is betting on um, that does not that there is not political will within NATO in the West, nor is Article Five apply, of course, um, for NATO, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, so that's at the operational level. At the tactical level, and you're, when you're a military planner. Uh, you start to look at things that, frankly, when you're doing military planning, planning sound boring. What is the condition, the material condition of the, the tires on your tanks, uh, the, the amount of um, shelling, the amount, sorry, the amount of uh, ammunition that you have? Um, what, uh, what are the, or the routes that you're going to make through the city and making sure that everybody's on that plan? Russia is clearly experiencing the fog of war when it comes to that. They do not understand how... Ukrainians are defending their cities. Ukrainians, um, I read one comment um, an unattributed to a commander north of Kiev that just said, we have planted an entire circle of anti-tank mines all around the city. Um, and that's how we plan to defend in multiple layers. And that uh, both sides, it seems, may have uh, be still reserving um, the strongest equipment that they have. And as Putin, I think you mentioned, Leon uh, gets more desperate, we may see uh, more of that. And then I'm sure we'll talk about this, which is all of this at the strategic level is meant to um, allow there to be time um, for Ukraine and the West in order to be able to resupply Ukraine with what they need. Um, and so it's the United States, I think, um, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, put it clearly, what is the goal um, for the United States and NATO right now? It is for Russia to uh, have, have the highest cost to pay um, for what it's doing in Ukraine, even if it ultimately is able to succeed in occupying parts or all of uh, Ukraine. So I'll leave it there because that's sort of uh, the situation I see right now from a military planner's perspective. Um, and I look forward to engaging with, uh, with the audience and with my fellow panelists. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate your perspective. I'm now going to first turn to uh, Honorable Sikorsky 
Uh, welcome again. Uh, you're also a great friend of LSC Ideas. Um, you have a very distinguished background, uh, first as a journalist in terms of covering uh, a variety of conflicts uh, and um, uh, before you held a variety of government positions, uh, one of which was as, as Minister of Defence in Poland. So I would first like to kick off this discussion by maybe asking you about the refugee crisis um, that we are witnessing in Poland right now. More than 1.8 million Ukrainians have crossed into Poland alone since the conflict began. Um, and, and it seems like uh, Poland is really feeling the pressure of, of welcoming um, all these refugees. Um, what is the status of the refugee crisis in Poland? And, uh, in Poland and, and what are you anticipating at, at this point? Thank you. You're on mute, I'm sorry. Thank you for the question, but I'd like to start by congratulating you on securing, securing the services of Jamie Sher and to congratulate Jamie on his elevation to be the Knight of the British Empire. Well done, Jamie. Um, uh, yes, you're right. From 101st country in the world in terms of the number of refugees we have in two weeks become the number fourth country in the world in the number of refugees um, and uh, most of them have been received in polish homes uh, there's an unprecedented uh, countrywide action, literally, cities, uh, towns, villages. Um, I was with some um, Ukrainian ref refugees in our village school nearby, and, uh, you know, Ukrainian children are just joining Polish children at school. Um, and so this is a national uh, effort because essentially we feel that the Ukrainians are fighting our fight, and the least that we can do for them is to protect their women and children. Um, What's underreported is that estimated 80,000 Ukrainian uh, men who had been working on Polish building sites uh, before the war began uh, have actually gone back to Ukraine to fight. And this is something that uh, Putin clearly didn't anticipate, this, uh, this uh, willingness for sacrifice uh, in defense of their country on the part of Ukraine. So at the moment, the, the, the refugees have been absorbed, uh, but of course the, the difficulties uh, are just starting because um, there just aren't 1.5 million uh, reserve uh, seats at Polish schools and preschools. Uh, there aren't hundreds of thousands of uh, reserve uh, beds in Polish hospitals. Um, so Poland needs help uh, both uh, financially and materially, and also we need other European countries to, uh, to, to, to uh, um, receive some of those refugees. And many of them will be already going on to, to Germany, to wherever they have friends and, uh, and, uh, and, and relatives. Uh, but this is urgent because uh, if uh, Putin escalates, I can imagine the numbers doubling and trebling, and then Poland will not be able to, to, uh, to cope on its own. Thank you for those very interesting insights. And we're going to come back to you later with some uh, questions on defense security also for, for Poland. Um, I'm now going to turn to Sir Jamie. Um, sir, you have uh, a lot of experience uh, also with regards to NATO, and uh, we also know that NATO will convene at the level of defense ministers uh, this Wednesday and Thursday. Now, given your experience, especially as NATO's, uh, as a former NATO Deputy Assistant Secretary, can you walk us through what the NATO member states are discussing right now? What are their main priorities, short-term and long-term, as a result of, of, of this war? Thank you. 
Uh, Leon, thanks very much. Uh, thanks to you. Thanks to Julia for welcoming me back to uh, the LSC, uh, one of my first and most enduring loves. Uh, Leon uh, and uh, Radak picked this up. You have uh, very kindly uh, elevated me to sir, uh, but it's not true. It's entirely fake news. Sorry about that. Um, I have something called a CMG, uh, which is nice to have, uh, but it's not a knighthood. Clearly, I serve my country well, but not yet well enough. Hopefully, <laughs> there's still time. But uh, no, I, in, I need to be clear about that. Uh, but thank you all the same. Um, now, uh, as far as NATO is concerned, I think there are four things, Leon, very briefly, that are really key. Number one, uh, this, this crisis has exposed NATO's uh, uh, comparative military weakness uh, on its eastern flank. Um, we have, as you know, multinational battalions, uh, but they are small in number, and they're mainly focused on Poland and the Baltic states. So there is an urgent need to uh, turn those uh, battalions into something much stronger, uh, brigades, maybe divisions, uh, NATO will have to decide. Uh, and uh, we have to turn the rotational forces that go in and out into more permanent forces that have a clear mission uh, assigned uh, uh, to them. Uh, NATO has to look at uh, the reinforcements, it has to look at air defense, all of these kind of things. Uh, you could argue, Leon, that maybe some of this work should have been done after 2014, uh, after Russia gave us already a big warning sign, a down payment on what was to come when it annexed uh, Crimea and, of course, pushed into the uh, the Donbass uh, uh, region. NATO at the time, I think, uh, as always, wanted to square the magic circle between defending against Russia, deterring Russia, while not antagonizing Russia. But, of course, whatever the outcome of, this, uh, uh, of the issue in Ukraine, uh, one thing looks clear, we're going to have more Russian forces closer to us, uh, in Ukraine, in, in Belarus, elsewhere, able to strike at a moment's notice. And of course, there's always, as Radak very well knows, um, uh, and as uh, Jacob mentioned, with the missile uh, coming very close the other day to Polish territory, the cruise missiles, there's always the danger that uh, the conflict could spill over onto NATO territory, or that Putin could even try to attack NATO territory. Uh, maybe it's not likely, but it's more likely than it was just a couple of weeks ago. So I think that's the most urgent task for NATO really to define urgently what the new posture in the East uh, should uh, look like, because in the past, deterrence meant that you you didn't have to fight. Uh, you simply needed to demonstrate political will. Now, unfortunately, deterrence means demonstrating political will, but being able to fight and win if you have to as well. I, I think the second thing that will preoccupy Leon NATO uh, this week, um, and uh, again, this is not uh, uh, unknown to the audience, is to, again, straddle this difficult balancing act in terms of supporting the Ukrainian forces. Uh, as was said, they've put up a, a very good, Jason said this, very good uh, performance thus far uh, in resisting. Um, and of course, uh, if they're going to continue to resist, they're going to depend upon Western military aid. And certainly we mustn't afford to be uh, intimidated by Putin here uh, when it comes to the threats uh, of looking upon NATO as a, a belligerent. Well, no nonetheless have to calculate what is bluster and bluff in Putin's posture and what kind of NATO actions, and of course the no-fly zone has come up in this context, what kind of NATO actions could drive Putin into some kind of uh, strike against NATO itself. We're going to have to have a, a, an appetite for risk. We're going to have to keep cool nerves for a long period uh, because obviously uh, we can't uh, afford to, to simply give uh, the Ukrainians uh, water bottles and helmets and uniforms uh, in, in the hope that that will uh, not uh, antagonize uh, uh, Putin. We also have to adapt the support that we give to the Ukrainians to the kind of battle they're going to fight. No good giving them Patriot air defense systems, no matter how useful, if, of course, it's going to take months or even years to train them. Um, uh, they, if they are um, mounting an insurgency with lots of volunteers, lots of irregulars, with little military training, the equipment, the tactics, of course, have to be adapted to their modus uh, operandi. We can't afford another Afghanistan where we trained an army for a mission that it couldn't accomplish uh, without the support that we were no longer able to give it. Um, and, of course, I think in that respect, there are lots of things like cyber effects, intelligence, intercepting Russian military communications, uh, special forces, training locally, and so on, that we can look at. Also, a 
very briefly, then we're going to have to sort of think, and this is not going to be very palatable to us, but we're going to have to think of, you know, what is Ukraine likely to look like at the end of this kind of crisis? Um, uh, what are the various scenarios and how, what do we still have in the locker that could prevent the worst case scenario, a total Russian subjugation of Ukraine or a peace settlement entirely dictated by Moscow? How can we prevent those worst case scenarios from happening? Uh, I think, Leon, very briefly, and I'll, I'll promise I'll stop in two sentences, but clearly maintaining the sanctions is going to be key. Uh, so far, there's been this incredible coalition to impose sanctions. And as I speak, more are rolling off the production line with the UK and the EU today taking sanctions or, or, or more oligarchs on steel uh, and so on. The private sector has got involved uh, as, as well, um, which is unprecedented. But sanctions, as everybody knows, take some time to bite. We need to maintain this coalition over the long haul. And we've got to have a very clear conditionality. We can't have it that as soon as, you know, Putin accepts some kind of local ceasefire around Mariupol, immediately countries argue, well, that's it. Uh, you know, we now have a, a, a kind of stalemate and we can lift the sanctions. And of course, what we do vis-a-vis -vis the so-called neutrals uh, like India or others who have refused to implement the sanctions uh, to try to get them at least not to circumvent uh, the sanctions, this debate has arisen already with China, I think is going to be uh, crystal clear. Finally, Leon, and this is probably going to be a good topic for discussion, uh, we are unfortunately back into a containment strategy vis-a-vis -vis Russia, exactly where we did not want to be after 1991 and the fall of the Berlin Wall, but we are where we are, and uh, Putin is going to be an adversary for us, not just in Ukraine, but in hybrid attacks on the West, uh, in undermining our position in Africa, the Middle East, as we've already seen, for example, in the Sahel uh, and, 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 and elsewhere, uh, in trying to find allies in the rest of the world, like China, who, who can also undermine us. And it, we're going to have to sort of come up with a, a kind of strategy, such as we had uh, uh, after George Kennan uh, uh, wrote his famous articles in the late 1940s, which is going to be a mixture of decoupling ourselves from Russia so that it can no longer uh, blackmail us, but at finding instruments to uh, constrain Russia while we wait for hopefully that third democratic revolution to break out in Russia, uh, which hopefully will be a little bit more longer lasting than the two previous democratic uh, revolutions. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for reminding us of those sanctions also. Um, uh, according to one report, at least there's a possibility that Russia may default on its uh, debt uh, as soon as tomorrow. So these sanctions are definitely biting. Um, I'm now going to turn to Dr. Gurana Gurgic. Uh, Gurana, what a pleasure to have you here uh, from Zagreb. And my first question has to do uh, with, uh, um, you know, Europe-related question. I know you can speak about many different issues, but um, Henry Kissinger is uh, often wrongly credited for asking, who do I call when I want to call Europe? Now, uh, my question to you is, who are the main? players in Europe right now leading efforts with regards to the Russia-Ukraine war? What are the issues they're focusing on? Thank you. Thanks, Leon, and it's great to be part of this very distinguished panel. Um, and uh, well done to you and the team for coordinating between all the time zones, uh, Sydney, London, um, Zagreb, and the rest. Um, so, before I answer that question, if you can indulge me just for a second, because I am at the moment um, in Zagreb, so uh, looking at everything that's happening from the Balkans, um, but with my academic hat on, and um, as someone who lived in the Balkans um, all through the 1990s, I can't escape this sort of eerie feeling of the similarities in the lead up to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and um, the failure of the international community, frankly, to prevent this invasion. But what has been heartening and to an extent gratifying is the fact that the response this time around came much swifter. And I think this owes to the very fact that the international system these days is very much different to what it was back uh, some 30 years ago, 20 years ago. And there is a sense that Ukraine basically represents a kind of microcosm of a struggle between democracies and autocracies. I probably wouldn't go as far in this because we've seen some 
democracies that aren't necessarily on board with supporting Ukraine at this point in time, or as much as potentially the West would like them to see. Uh, and similarly, maybe some autocracy, autocracy is not leaning in as much uh, at the same time. But certainly, uh, this is a, a very much a different world, one uh, where this sort of dominant paradigm of strategic competition has made it so that the response is now uh, uh, framed much more in uh, geoeconomic terms, but also obviously in geopolitical terms. And then to get to your question, really, I, I promise, I'll, I'll get to that, um, which is Europe. Um, who do you call? Uh, do you call Germany? Do you call France? Uh, do you call the UK? Uh, or do you call the European Commission? I think uh, it really depends, uh, said she very academically, uh, depending on what type of response you're looking for. I think what has been uh, really remarkable, uh, the fact that we've seen just uh, essentially in the span of one weekend, uh, the German policy of pacifism turned around 180 uh, and uh, basically paving the way uh, towards something that will look like Germany uh, becoming the largest military power in Europe, one without nuclear weapons, but certainly in the in terms of uh, the, the total uh, uh, euros spent towards defense. And this is one bell that can't be unrung. Uh, also, the status of certain countries that have been neutral, uh, such as Sweden or Finland, that we might very well see in NATO uh, very swiftly. In terms of the humanitarian response, we've already heard uh, from uh, Representative uh, Sikorsky around uh, the, the response that we've seen from Poland, for instance, or other countries uh, in uh, Ukraine's neighborhood. And this has been something that has been really heartening uh, and something uh, that uh, European Union obviously failed uh, to do back uh, during the peak of the 2015 refugee crisis. But then we've also seen uh, certain steps on part of the European Commission, which I think are quite significant as well in terms of uh, not only the EU's response, but also the coordination um, and, and the steps forward in terms of uh, where to with NATO, for instance, uh, that uh, we could see cooperation furthering and deepening uh, in uh, not just obviously now provision of aid to Ukraine, but also in terms of actually being strategic about building up those capabilities, about building cohesion, uh, about doing all of those things in the, the baskets of the uh, strategic compass. So I think that a lot of bells have been unrung in just a span of a couple of weeks. Uh, and it's not just a matter of one country doing it. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of uh, the, the kind of pulling and, and hauling uh, on part of uh, European Union as a whole. Thank you, Gorana. You've given us plenty of food for thought, but we'll pick up uh, uh, when we circle back to you again. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to turn back to Jason. If you could unmute, please. Um, Jason, it looks like uh, Putin has been unable to capture key cities in Ukraine, or at least it's taken much longer than anticipated in some uh, regards. Uh, and, and as a result, it seems like he's starting to bomb some of these cities with uh, very heavy artillery. What are you anticipating uh, will happen in the coming days uh, on, on the battleground? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you, Radislav, Jamie, and Grana as well. Um, it, again, it is an honor to be here with you. Uh, so what we're seeing right now is the volume and the volume multiplied over time of, of, of relatively similar uh, few days, um, even the last week when it comes to the, the Russian tactic of advancing on major cities to the east and, of course, um, to Mariupol into the south, and we're going to see more of that. What you're not seeing is much Ukrainian counterattack. Um, one of the reasons being, um, back to the military planning uh, standpoint, which is you reserve um, what you have in order to be most impactful. And any weapons that they have, whether it's anti-tank weapons, they've shown successfully um, that in convoys approaching Kyiv, for example, to the north, they've been able to hold Kyiv by holding a lot of these uh, anti-tank weapons, um, anti-air uh, missiles that they are able to that they are able to use. 
I mean, effectively in order to keep Russia from being able to advance. Um, so I would say that in the next few days, you're going to see more of that. Russia's calculation would be that uh, we, we can, uh, through attrition in these local areas, continue to steadily advance. And that would be in the tactical or operational level that they could do that. Now, what that means at the operational or strategic level uh, for Putin is those initial questions that I stated, which is, it, is there a logistics chain that it can actually support this? Um, Jamie brought up, you know, what, what does it look like um, for the future of Ukraine? Absolutely. I think one of those key questions would be, does, does anybody actually think that Russia can hold territory that it could bear, that has barely been able to gain? Um, so whether Putin is able to at the um, in, in, in forthcoming talks, um, of course, will in, do whatever he can to save face, um, be able to withdraw some of those troops back to, let's say, you know, sort of a um, an Israel Lebanon type security zone arrangement where they're across the border and can state that they made their point um, and that um, and in order for some kind of loose um, agreement that um, of, of any kind that would signal that Ukraine or Georgia would not be um, moving toward NATO membership, which is, of course, what the stated um, strategic goal was there. Um, so that, that's what we could see um, in, the, in the next several weeks. On the military side, um, you just look at, it's really a geography and math problem when it comes to being able to get a lot of the um, a, a lot of the equipment that is coming into Western Ukraine from NATO allies across the border. Um, and since um, a no-fly zone was brought up, um, can just uh, just mention this briefly, that in order to uh, have a no-fly zone, um, you need to be an active combatant um, because you need to defend the no-fly zone. So one of the big questions about why has there not been a no-fly zone, even for a humanitarian corridor, is because if Russia did um, uh, in any way attempt to break into that humanitarian corridor, and we are seeing uh, reports of humanitarian corridors being compromised out of cities, um, then that would be another reason for escalation. So if you if you're looking at the next week or two, um, both Putin and uh, NATO, uh, for example, will be looking for off ramps to any kind of escalation. And I know that um, once again, uh, solely because there were so many public remarks from the U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan stating that um, we do have to brace ourselves for any kind of escalation asymmetrically in you know cyber, chemical, um, uh, even the posturing when it comes to nuclear, solely because um, Putin is clearly becoming a little bit more, I mean, the word is desperate, but from a military um, planning standpoint, it's that you'd be moving to the next phase of escalation uh, because you haven't met your objectives um, at the current phase. Um, so that's what we'll see. And um, I'm not the expert in how this enables talks. And I would love to um, hear what the panel thinks about what this could mean um, for, you know, around uh, what, what the military um, uh, aspect of this supports uh, for the dipl diplomatic and political uh, next steps. Thank you. Thank you. I hope we can raise that uh, question for sure. Um, just while, while we have you, um, you mentioned cyber warfare also. Uh, Ukraine's been a playground for Russian cyber criminal, criminals and, and state-sponsored actors over the last few years, way beyond this recent escalation of this conflict. Now, what yes. are your main observations, just very briefly, with regards to cyber warfare so far? Um, so, uh, and as you know, Leon, I'm, um, I'm an early, uh, early founder of the U.S. Cyber Command, uh, and one of the ways that we've looked at cyber over the last decade has really been that it's useful most in those gray zone operations. Um, and I would summarize from my personal perspective that, um, that cyber, you're not seeing too much cyber currently because you've been seeing cyber over the last decade, um, Russia um, uh, pummeling Ukraine in multiple different ways um, and, and is doing the conventional action right now because Russia has been unsuccessful in using gray zone operations in cyber in order to do so. Um, cyber is also, when it comes to a larger scale, um, it's not like a missile. Um, if you have a capability, uh, it's very possible you'll lose it by using it once. Um, so there are likely, I would assess, Russian reserves when it comes to cyber capabilities. But the question is, if you're a cyber operations planner and you're able to, let's say, take out a power grid um, in, a, in a next phase environment by using a missile, um, why would you use one of your high-end cyber capabilities in order to um, take out that power grid? Particularly because we're in a very, uh, as we've talked about many times, we're in a, um, an, a very specific escalation observation game right now. What is escalation? And uh, I, I always say that chapter zero, maybe the foreword of the book on cyber, understanding cyber escalation and modern warfare is still being written. Um, how uh, cyber operations are viewed by either side. And so I imagine that um, that is why we're seeing sort of limited um, cyber operations, besides, of course, misinformation and disinformation being used 
throughout. But again, back to my comment about what can we look for in an increasingly, and again, the, the word is often used desperate, but really Putin moving into the next phase of operations, what would that planning, um, what would that plan entail when it comes to escalation and cyber could very well be a piece of it. Thank you, those are great points. Um, I'm now going to turn to Radek again. Um, the proximity of the airstrikes on uh, Yavorov Bay in Lviv in the far west of Ukraine occurred less than 10 miles from the Polish border. Now this is, I think, a vivid reminder of how close Poland is to the war. Um, and uh, also we should add that, that the biggest share of military equipment, both lethal and non-lethal, uh, will be going through through Poland, from my understanding. Now, as a frontline state, what are the main defense and security concerns for Poland at present? What's what's the discussion on this? Thank you. I think you might be muted. I am not. There we go. Can you hear us? Who are you talking to? Yes. D did you hear the question? I got thrown out of the meeting, but I've, I've logged back on. So but I didn't <laughs> hear the question, sorry. Okay, so the main question is, as, as a frontline state, what are the main defense and security concerns right now for Poland? What are the main issues? Well, you know, we've been, um, begging uh, uh, our NATO um, allies for strengthening the eastern flank for not years but decades and um, it was poo-pooed uh, for a long time oh you central Europeans are so oversensitive about Russia we understand your difficult history but no better uh, relax it'll be fine um, Putin would never do uh, any such thing um, so it was only under President Obama that even theoretical contingency plans uh, were written for the defense of uh, Central Europe. And it was only at the end of Obama's second term that a tiny contingent, literally a dozen guys, um, was put at our main air, air, air base just as a technical team to receive uh, U.S. aircraft. Um, I remember asking for for uh, two heavy brigades, which is what the uh, NATO uh, Russia agreement uh, even allowed, and um, this was greeted with howls of uh, disapproval, um, provocation against Russia, all that stuff. Um, uh, so, since uh, some of you, not you in this uh, seminar, but uh, some of you didn't listen to us then, now that we've been vindicated, I expect you to listen to us now. And our argument has essentially been that NATO infrastructure and, and defense capability should not be where they historically were created in a different era and where it's nice and comfortable, um, but where the threat is. And the threat is not in Portugal, is not in Naples, it's not in the UK, it's not even in Rammstein. It's where uh, Putin's uh, drones are flying and Putin tanks are operating. Two days ago, uh, I, I can send you, uh, I can upload you the film taken from the Polish side of the border on which you can see the bombing at the Yavorov um, Ukrainian um, uh, military field. You can even hear the distant rumble. And of course, Putin is not going to attack NATO anytime soon. A, because he can't even defeat Ukraine yet. B, even if he succeeds, um, he will need to build a new army because his old army is just being destroyed. And C, um, he must understand that as NATO, we are 18 times stronger economically than Russia. And his generals might say, uh, Mr. President, uh, maybe that's not a good idea. 
but he's clearly a uh, Russian imperialist who wants to rebuild um, a, a multi-annual forced union that would claim um, that claims um, the right to determine uh, the policy and the, the geopolitical orientation of its neighbors. And that's not something I think we can accept. So, um, so we need to do what uh, some of us have been advocating for a long time. We need to rearm. Um, and we need to first uh, take stock of how disarmed we are. I mean, Poland has been spending its 2% uh, of GDP on defense for years, but you know, we are pr protecting the rest of Europe at our expense. Um, uh, you know, my favorite statistic, and I mean, this war may, may mean that the tank as, a, as, as the decisive force on a modern battlefield is entering history, but still it is um, symbolic that Germany has 250 tanks, France has 240 tanks, and Britain has just gone under 200 tanks. And Russia, according to CIPRI, the uh, Swedish Institute of International Affairs, who, which follows these things, has 13,000 tanks. Poland is, is a, a, at about 1,000. Um, and I, I'm not a, um, a fanatic for tanks. Perhaps we need more drones and other stuff. But we clearly need to match um, power with power. We need to deter this madman in the Kremlin because we don't know how far he might go. Um, and, and fortunately, Russia has lost Germany. Uh, we also need to um, set German rearmament in a secure European context so that we don't repeat um, uh, the, the, the bad um, chapters of European history and so that Germany's rearmament is safe for Germany's neighbors and for Germany itself. Thank you, thank you for that. And, and we do recognize that there are asymmetric uh, implications for a different NATO member states uh, with, with regards to this conflict and also uh, the impacts. Um, and we thank you for, for Poland's uh, support to the refugees, especially. Um, I'm now going to turn to Jamie again. Jamie, I'm just, I just want to bounce off of something that Jason Israel mentioned earlier uh, about the no-fly zone uh, with regards you have to be a direct belligerent uh, in order to enforce that. What do you think would be the possibility of perhaps a, a, a no-fly zone under the UN banner? You have a lot of experience from the 1990s with regards to Bosnia and and uh, um, so so how do you how do you feel about a possible let's say a UN or a NATO no fly zone for Ukraine? Uh, how will that impact on the humanitarian issues and the conflict? And and more importantly, what are the other risks related to putting peacekeeping troops in between the belligerents? Because it's not always a very black and white matter. Thank you. No, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right uh, uh, about that, Leon. Uh, obviously, the Bosnian analogy is not so distant. I mean, I totally uh, endorse what Jason said about the uh, fact that uh, you know, to have a no-fly zone uh, operating safely, NATO would have to take out the Russian air defense, you know, the S-400s, uh, the anti-systems, all of the others, the radars. Uh, many of those are deep inside Russia, just like the 24 cruise missiles that Russia fired at the Yav Yavarif training center on Sunday were fired from deep within uh, Russia. So clearly that would not simply be an operation uh, in Ukraine itself. It would extend into Russia, possibly Belarus, possibly Kaliningrad, where some of these systems are installed as well. Uh, and certainly that would be a big and risky military operation, given uh, the density and the modern nature of that air defense and the clearly NATO would then have entered the war uh, and, and I agree with those who say that uh, wisdom here is is obviously to try to push Russia out of Ukraine without having the price of World War III 
uh, uh, to pay for it. Um, so although I obviously understand the emotional appeals from so many, including President uh, Zelensky, uh, again, I, I, I agree with Jason, as military planners, you have to keep a cool head, you have to do no harm, you have to do things that are actually going to be effective uh, and help the side you're trying to help. Now, the uh, problem also with a, a no-fly zone is that if you have a force on the ground that you're trying to protect, and you mentioned a UN force that possibly could go in, uh, you may have to agree, and this happened in Bosnia in the 90s to NATO, of course, that you have a so-called dual key arrangement where you, know, you can't intervene unless the UN commander on the ground gives his or her permission. And we know from Bosnia that you know, when NATO wanted to intervene, the UN said no, and vice versa. Um, the UN soldiers rapidly became hostages, many of course from NATO countries, uh, 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 meaning that you know, NATO had soldiers on the ground that were frustrating NATO pilots in the air. It was a bad, bad, bad time uh, for NATO. And I don't think you know, NATO would want to stake its credibility on those kind of uh, amorphous arrangements. Same, um, Leonie, if you mention things like safe areas, you know, particularly with cities at the moment being bombarded, like in Bosnia, uh, some are saying, well, you know, let's have safe areas, which sounds fine. But again, if you don't, uh, uh, if you're unable to demilitarize those uh, areas, which was the case in Bosnia, Russians would still consider them to be legitimate military targets. Uh, and we would have a replay of what we saw at Srebrenica or, or elsewhere. So I, I think whatever NATO wants to do, it needs to maintain its total autonomy of uh, action and be wary uh, of the Russians saying let's freeze the situation with some kind of UN force going in uh, because we've seen that in Cyprus we've seen that elsewhere where that UN force goes in and simply consolidates a new de facto division of the country like in Cyprus which carries on for decades and decades and decades with no resolution in sight and before you know where you are behind that UN uh, uh, peacekeeping force you have lots of new people's republics uh, Mariupol Badans, Godessar, or God knows what, are all springing up, uh, which make it almost impossible to see how, uh, for example, uh, the Ukraine could be reintegrated within its original territory uh, uh, afterwards. So, you know, be very careful of so-called so phony uh, peace settlements, which uh, in fact simply store up problems for later on. Uh, you know, we don't, just final comment here, what we have to avoid if we can is a situation where, we, you know, we just replay uh, the Donbass, where Russia comes in uh, with proxy forces, of course, doing its dirty work for it, uh, takes a piece of territory, uh, then creates a new front line, which the Ukrainian army then has to defend with massive casualties. 14,000 already, of course, from the period of the Donbass over uh, many years, uh, while we wait for the Duma to pass a resolution to ask Putin to formally recognize that kind of territory. So we go from a hot war in Ukraine back to that kind of, you know, endless uh, uh, grey aerial war uh, with casualties every day of the week uh, and uh, just giving Putin time to rest and recover before he repeats it all to push that front line even further towards Western Ukraine. That's why I say that there may not be any good options, but we desperately need to see what we can do to frustrate those kind of outcomes, which would be wholly in the Putin playbook. Thank you, Jamie. I'm now going to turn back to Gorana. I want you to give us some uh, big picture issues here, please. Uh, uh, in June, NATO will be convening in Madrid. NATO will be adopting the strategic concept, uh, concept at, the, at, at the summit. It's, it's a key document, of course, for the Alliance. It reaffirms NATO values, uh, uh, purpose, and provides a collective assessment of security. The last time it was adopted was in 2010. Uh, at the same time, we're also, uh, we also know that uh, uh, closer here to Europe, uh, European leaders are, are drawing up a new military uh, strategy document, uh, the Strategic uh, Compass. It's supposed to be adopted this month. Can you briefly tell us how the Russia-Ukraine war uh, uh, is impacting uh, these these these? Uh, concepts and this idea of security in Europe and NATO. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Leon. Um, and certainly there is nothing like a big external threat that uh, brings together uh, countries and that 
puts a jolt into strategic thinking and, and uh, makes it reevaluate or make the countries reevaluate uh, where they are going in terms of their uh, defense and security. What I would say, first of all, as someone who uh, is an academic at the University of Sydney, uh, is that uh, a lot of us who uh, are uh, somewhere or stationed around the Indo-Pacific were looking at these strategic documents precisely because we thought that uh, both strategic concept and the strategic compass, so the, the two documents that you mentioned that are going to see the day of light uh, uh, with the uh, uh, coming summits of the EU and NATO uh, in in, in coming months, uh, that they would be making uh, a bigger statement around uh, China and uh, that this would be a kind of moment of uh, transplanting the transatlantic uh, uh, cooperation into the Indo-Pacific. Obviously, uh, 24th of February has changed everything, and I think it has changed a lot of things uh, irrevocably, as I already mentioned uh, in the earlier remarks. Uh, NATO is back to its core mission of deterrence and defense. I, I don't uh, think that there is any out about uh, where the focus is going to be and I'm pretty sure that as you know these conversations go on around the strategic concept around consensus building because obviously it has to be a consensual affair uh, that uh, this is going to be highlighted. Of course we are going to see uh, a role for NATO in terms of the crisis management in terms of cooperative security but probably uh, less pronounced uh, than uh, it would have been had it not been for Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, so that's that's one thing, and I, I uh, would hate to speculate on some of these matters, but, you know, the talk of including things like uh, some of these mega trends like cyber, like climate change, they're going to make their way in it, but I think that there is no doubt that uh, the what, what we've seen uh, happening and, and what we are witnessing in Ukraine these days has changed the calculus very, very much. Um, on the EU front, uh, the strategic compass was supposed to be this sort of uh, a, 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 an exercise of self-reflection, but also, uh, again, uh, a kind of a path towards the future, especially in those uh, baskets, so whether it's around resilience and capabilities or whether it's around crisis management and partnerships. So uh, basically for the EU to decide what sort of actor it wants to be and it has obviously been thinking about this for quite some time uh given the the triple shocks that that we've seen in terms of you know the illegal annexation of Crimea ensuing war in Donbas in terms of Brexit uh obviously in terms of Donald Trump's presidency and uh what it meant uh for European security so it's no wonder that uh German presidency of the European Council made this uh the kind of uh thing that EU would be doing and now that it wraps up with uh the French presidency but again uh we are I think again more like than not see uh, the, those kind of uh, um, pointers point much more on um, on, on the eastern uh, uh, borders uh, of uh, the European Union uh, than say you know uh, the the kind of ambition that uh, was potentially there uh, before Russia's invasion. Uh, and I think that this is something that actually the US administration overall uh, is supportive of, that there is uh, much more of the, the kind of appetite on part of the Europeans to take matters into their own hands. Uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, far past the era of, uh, you know, no uh, 3Ds uh, uh, of, of Madeleine Albright and, and similar. So that there is this sense that for the US, uh, the, the name of the game is uh, obviously strategic competition with China. And the more that Europeans can be secure and, and the, the more that they can provide for their own defense, uh, the greater latitude that the United States is going to have. That's not to say that it will disinvest from Europe uh, and, and certainly, you know, there's been uh, plenty of signals towards that, uh, but that at the same time, U.S. Uh, strategic calculus moving into 21st century uh, is one that is not necessarily Euro-Atlantic centered, but uh, that looks into the Pacific. Thank you, Gorana. I'm going to now just fire away a few questions to all the panelists that I'd like.
like to ask you to be very brief, 30, 40 seconds, so we can get a question into each of you before we close the session. Um, Gorana, while you are on fire there, I'm going to ask the first one to you. Uh, I mean, you in recent days, you've witnessed the 1970s era drone that crashed uh, into Croatia, and it's, it's somewhere there from the from Ukraine or Russia, it's unsure where it's from. Um, but it's perhaps symbolic that we cannot separate events uh, in, 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 in Ukraine right now from events in the Balkans, I think. Um, there are strong links between President Putin and Serbia's President Vucic, as well as Bosnian Serb leader, leader uh, Dodik. Uh, can you talk to us just briefly about how this conflict is impacting on the Balkans? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think we can go from, you know, the worst case scenario where uh, Russia just uh, ramps up kind of being a spoiler and potentially uh, does something along the lines of uh, fully supporting, say, Dodik's proclamation of independence of Republika Srpska, or the best case scenario, which would be that uh, Putin is so consumed with what's going on in Ukraine that uh, he maybe forgets for a while about the Balkans. But I think what's essential to know about the Balkans is that uh, Russia is an important, obviously, uh, player in the region, but it, that it tends to overpromise and underdeliver. but it has a very good PR as, as being a spoiler. And it certainly has no shortage of authoritarian fanboys. It has no shortage of uh, Russian clients. So uh, for uh, quite, quite some time it's been uh, good to be Putin's friend if you wanted to further your you know business uh, uh, investments in the region and uh, potentially you know hide or launder money but also that there are plenty of cynics uh, around you know the role of the West and all of this obviously gives that fertile ground uh, for Russia to be active in the region but uh, I uh, would would say that you know in terms of forecasts into the future what might happen uh, I, I wouldn't go as far to say that uh, with, you know, determination, we are going to see uh, the proclamation of independence of Republika Srpska, you know, tomorrow or in a, in a month. But uh, the fact that uh, things are in unstable, but unstable, not unstable enough uh, is already a worry and it, things are not going to get necessarily better given that strategic focus is uh, definitely not on the Balkans these days when you talk about, you know, EU's uh, role in, in US more broadly. Thank you, Gorana. Jason, very quickly, very brief, please. Uh, can Ukraine survive by itself? Uh, sorry, can Ukraine survive uh, by fighting directly against Russia despite the continual military assistance from NATO members who do not directly involve or are not directly involved in the war? Yep, uh, very briefly, I put a, a small comment there in the QA, but non aligned countries and what is going on behind the scenes right now. If this moves on into the next month, we absolutely key. I and mean, we've already seen a bit of it with China, but questions like India with the growing, um, uh, the growing quadrilateral discussions that uh, are moving India closer to um, the US and these things and how they might be viewed to come forward will be absolutely telling. Uh, but thus far, Ukraine has shown it can hold defenses. And if resupplies keep coming in, even though there will be continued cost, um, terrible cost to civilians, and of course, Ukrainians fleeing and the refugee uh, um, in, and the refugees moving across and what um, is to be done with that, um, that will be a, a major factor. Uh, but they, they've shown the ability to hold. Thank you. Now um, I'm turning to Radek, if you could unmute, please. Uh, uh, as EU representatives, we know that the Polish, Czech and Slovenian prime ministers are traveling by train to Kiev today for talks with Ukraine's president and prime minister. Uh, now we know that they will uh, present details of a concrete uh, package of support to Ukraine. What can we expect from this package? I don't know enough uh, about uh, this trip, and uh, and I don't know to what extent they are being uh, in the name of the EU or in just their own names, and therefore whether this is a, a, a member states a package or or a European one. Um, some reports say that they merely informed uh, EU authorities of, of what they're doing. I, I, I just don't know. Um, 
But um, I'm sure President Zelensky is pleased because he needs uh, the solidarity and he needs to keep up the morale of his people. Um, and let's remember what this confront confrontation with Russia is about. Uh, the Maidan in 2014 started when the previous president, Yanukovych, uh, refused to sign an association agreement with Russia. Russia was ready to pay Yanukovych $15 billion for Ukraine to join uh, Russia's customs union. And um, Yanukovych eventually was deposed because he stopped integration with the European Union. Um, so this is a war of independence, independence in order to join the West. Um, so any signs of solidarity from the West um, are immensely valuable to keep up the U Ukrainian morale. I therefore very much regret the, the fact that uh, the Versailles uh, European Council uh, refused to grant Ukraine a candidate status, um, which would be symbolic and practical at the same time. Uh, it would give access to certain meetings of the EU, it would broaden the uh, uh, the uh, flow of um, pre-accession uh, funds to the EU uh, without giving any guarantee of membership because, as, as we know, you can be a candidate for decades. Um, uh, so, um, you, you know, we, we have to support Ukraine in all kinds of ways, including uh, symbolic ones. Thank you. Thank you for those reminders. Um, Jamie, I'm going to ask a quick question to you. Uh, uh, so, very brief answer, please. It's from one of our um, alumni members, Travis Bean. Uh, he's asking uh, about uh, Ian Stoltenberg has now warned that Russian forces could possibly use chemical weapons. If that happens, what response might we expect from NATO, from the EU? Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for that. Uh, uh, that's a great question. Well, first of all, I think one of the things that the United States and the Allies have done very well so far uh, has been these kind of intelligence driven uh, communications or warnings, you know, of the Russian attack, where clearly the US got it right, uh, largely correcting uh, the error vis a vis Iraq in 2003. Um, obviously, also the war crimes investigations that are putting down a big marker uh, of what could uh, hit Putin and his acolytes in future in terms of uh, tr tr uh, war crimes trials in The Hague and the warning on chemicals. And and I think this is the right thing, you know, get the Russians on the back foot because these intelligence driven operations also not only issue a warning, but they give time for the international community um, to build up a kind of resolve, as is evident in the sanctions uh, and in terms of being ready to take countermeasures. Of course, we know that, you know, Russia has been here before, maybe in a limited way recently, uh, like using polonium in London back in 2010, or, or Novichok in Salisbury a few years later, certainly not reigning in the Assad regime uh, in its use of uh, chemical weapons in, in Syria and, and, uh, and trying to block investigations by the Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons. We also know that notwithstanding uh, being a party to the Chemical Weapons Convention, Russia is very far from destroying its, uh, it, its stock. So uh, will Putin do it? I don't know. But but at least these intelligence driven operations make it clear what the price would have to be. Um, we need, however, I think to have, uh, if this is not going to lead to a NATO intervention, uh, and of course this debate has also latched onto the nuclear weapon as well, you know, what would be the threshold for a NATO intervention? But I've put that aside for the moment, but we need to have a couple of extra things in our locker to really uh, uh, deter Putin from going that far, uh, notwithstanding, of course, the international revulsion. I don't he cares about that um and therefore you know the cut off of gas the cut off of oil anything that would really you know be uh, a big option there uh, i mean we've gone a long way with sanctions thus far but we need to keep a couple of things in reserve for deterrence but again uh, we need to make sure that if we need to take those sanctions we've done our homework in our ability to source oil and gas from elsewhere so that we can deliver on the day. The, the, the worst thing we, we want to do is lose credibility by barking uh, the big bark, uh, uh, but then not having the big bite uh, when we need it. Thank you, Jamie. It sounds like we'll have to discuss how to negotiate with Iran next. Um, that brings us to the end of 
of our uh, panel discussion today, I want to thank all, all of you for your contributions and, and, and insights. We have way more questions than we can answer right now uh, in, in, in this possible time allocated to this. Uh, I just want to remind everyone also that we've dropped a link uh, in the chat about uh, uh, from our from the LSE Student Union. Um, they've set up a fundraising uh, a, a fund to raise funds for for Ukrainian refugees. So so please click on that link if you're able to support them. Um, then also I'd like to remind our audience also that we plan on having weekly panel discussions scheduled for every Wednesday which will bring together in-house and external experts, report on and discuss the war's impact and various global issues. Again, I thank you, my, I thank these panelists for their wonderful contributions and I hope to have you back on this uh, during these dialogues. Thank you.